So over the next three years, the cybersecurity industry is going to spend about a half a trillion dollars on tools and technology to protect your data and your information from hackers and uh, data breaches and identity theft. But unfortunately, not one dime is going to go to protect Alicia or the 20,000 kids that go missing in the United States of America every day from being exploited or uh, from online predators. Alicia is just like most other kids that we see in the United States. She's a 14-year-old child who um, had, had come from a, living, a loving family. She lived in Pittsburgh with her mother and her father. And she really was a, a young, precarious young lady who was enthralled with the internet. Now in 2002 when she was 14, most of us were not fully aware of the dangers and, the, and, and some of the things that we needed to be concerned about with the internet. So, you know, the, her parents, they went out and bought a computer and they put it home in, in, in a common area of their home where, where they knew that it needed to be because that was what the common uh, idea was at the time. If you're going to buy a computer, go ahead and buy it and, and put it where your kids can use it, but that you can watch to make sure that they're going to be safe. And Alicia, she loved it. She went out on the internet. She found lots of friends. Some of her friends from school were online, and they spent hours upon hours chatting and discussing about things that they couldn't do in the real world. And like many kids at the time, and adults really, uh, she met some people that were online that she had never known before. And some of them she became quite close with. One in particular um, she, she became really close with and wanted to actually meet in the real world. And, and they, they schemed and they, they kind of came up with a plan that on New Year's Eve in 2003 they were going to meet. The girl that she met online was going to have her father drive her to Alicia's town in Pittsburgh, her neighborhood, and they were just going to meet and talk, and, and that was the plan. Now, now, New Year's Eve for Alicia's family was really, really special. She would, they would have a big dinner, and her entire family would come over, and they would spend the evening together. And sometime between uh, dinner and dessert, Alicia told her mom that she wasn't feeling well and asked if she could go upstairs to her room, and of course her mother said, that's fine. Um, went in, but instead of going upstairs, Alicia, she slipped out the front door and went down the driveway and uh, slid out the end of the driveway and took a right and started walking away from her home. Now, it was late. It was probably 7 o'clock, and it was Pittsburgh, and it was, you know, obviously it was December 31st, so it was dark. And Alicia, she's not dumb. You know, she knew in her, that, that sound in her voice, those, that sound in her head, those little voices started to say, Alicia, this is probably not a good idea, and you should go home. So she stood and waited. The streets were deserted at that time. She stood and waited and uh, she thought, maybe I will go home. And she turned around to leave and she took a couple of steps and then she heard her name called. She turned around and, and this is where things get a little fuzzy for Alicia. She wasn't sure exactly how it happened, but the next thing she remembers, she's laying on the floor of the car, which is speeding out of her neighborhood. And, and she's being shoved down on the floor by somebody that she, she didn't really recognize and she didn't know who it was. Well, the person that she had been gotten into the car with was a guy by the name of Scott. He was a 40-year-old programmer from Reston, Virginia, who had come to uh, Pittsburgh to kidnap her and take her back to Virginia with him. So while she was on the floor, she was able to actually maneuver herself so that she could see out the window of the car. And she saw road signs flying by that she, she recognized the names of and she, she understood where she was. And she saw signs for the, for the Pennsylvania Turnpike and she thought that there would be an opportunity here where she would be able to get free because certainly they had to stop at the Turnpike booth and, and pick up the card and, and the, the toll booth operator would recognize that there was something wrong and, and call the police, but that didn't happen. Straight through the toll booth they went, um, and for six hours she laid on that floor not knowing where she was going and not knowing what was going to happen to her. Well, Scott drove all the way to his home in Reston, Virginia, and he parked his car in front of his house and grabbed her out of the, out of the passenger seat floor and dragged her inside down to the basement where he had built a dungeon for just this occasion. This is what he had planned to do. He was an online predator, okay? So once he got her down to the basement, he put a dog collar on her neck and a chain attached to it so they could take her up to his bedroom and chain her to the floor. And in that first day that she was there, he abused her, both tor tortured her uh, and physically abused her and videotaped it and then put that video out onto the internet in the networks that Scott traveled on the dark web that many of us hear about, but we don't exactly know what it is. And on the dark web, Scott's network of uh, compatriots were able to view these, this video and, 
and uh, do whatever they may with it as distribute it, which is what one of the things that the internet did for child pornography, in case you're wondering what we're talking about, is it allowed it to be easily distributed, unlike prior to the internet, where it was more or less moved around by hand. So for three days, three more days, Scott kept Alicia in his home, and he didn't feed her, tortured her, abused her. And on the fourth day in the morning, he said, Alicia, I like you too much. Tonight when, we get home from, when I get home from work, we're going to go for a ride. Alicia knew what that meant. So do you. That was the last day that Alicia was going to be on Earth. But fortunately, somebody had seen that video online. And the day that Alicia went missing, her parents contacted the FBI. And they started working with what was referred to as, at the time, was the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force, which is the FBI, state, and local police in Pittsburgh, which actually had one of the first Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. And they started working their magic of investigation to try to figure out where Alicia was based on clues in the video and some of the information that was provided by the tipster. And while Scott went off to work, they actually located Alicia in Reston, Virginia, arrested Scott, saved her, and in a few days she was reunited with her family. Now Alicia, very, very resilient young lady, she actually went on to create a uh, a foundation, it's called the Alicia Project, and she spends her time traveling around the United States and testifying before state and federal government committees trying to explain to them the importance of actually educating parents and children about some of the dangers that are online. Now no one wants to believe that the internet is a terrible place, and it's not. It is an amazing place, and all of us have had great fortune of growing up, or at least uh, living during the time when it went from a very small uh, network to a, one of the biggest networks that we can actually see. But th there's some things that we have to be aware of as far as how we're going to allow our children to, to thrive in this, this what is going to be a, an awesome way of life in, in the next 10 to 15 years. The Center for Missing and Exploited Children put out a lot of statistics for us to try to digest as it relates to uh, child abduction and missing children or children that get exploited online. And I'm going to bet that some of us, as we think about, this about these statistics, will recognize that perhaps somebody we know might fall in here. So like Alicia, about 4% of the, of the perpetrators or the, the predators that are online will actually try to make contact with a child uh, in the real world, 4%, 1 in 25, which is, which is if you think about it, is, 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 is quite significant given the total number of people that are online. Three quarters. Three quarters of the people that um, run into predators online meet them in some sort of social networking site, some sort of chat room. 75% think Facebook, think all those other applications that your kids are on or that young adults are on that have the chance of running into a predator. Half of the predators online go through the grooming process and that's really what it's all about and that's one of the things that I want to talk to you about today is this grooming process, this process where the predator actually tries to befriend the individual so that they can gain their trust. So half the time they're offering money or gifts to, the, to, the, to, the, to their victim. The rest of the time, like in Alicia's case, they're just being their friend. They're just trying to gain their confidence. They're trying to be their surrogate parent per se. 95% of the time, 95% of the time, the predator does not try to hide their age from their victim. In Alicia's case, they, they did. They tried to pass themselves off as a younger person. But 95% of the time, which is quite startling if you think about it, they do not try to hide how old they are. And the majority of the time, the victim willingly goes to meet them, just like in Alicia's case. So you're probably thinking, why did I come here today to talk about this, right? And I'll tell you, when I mentioned what I, to my wife what I wanted to talk about, she thought I, was, she thought I was crazy. She said, there's no way that this is appropriate. And I really had doubts, and I asked, is this okay to talk about to, to, to the TEDx folks? And, and it's an important message to say. So I drive home every day, and every day in the morning when I go to work, I see this sign, right? It says it happening here, uh, stop sexual exploitation of children or youth. And I see it again when I go home. Now, I live in a town that's got about 50 people in it. Ten of those people in that town related to me, which means some of them have had this occur to them. 
statistically, it's virtually certain that at least one of my children, or perhaps my grandchildren when they get older, will, will fall into this statistic, which is just a little bit too much for me to take, right? So Ralph Waldo Emerson says that, you know, one idea will light a thousand candles. Now, I have no idea if today is a good idea or I'm just a candle, but what I think we can do together as a, as a profession, as cybersecurity professionals who are spending tons of money on things, nothing to do with this, or us as a society or as a community, is we can just start having a conversation. We don't need to spend money. We don't need to go out and buy expensive things. We just need to start talking about it. Because when we start shining the light on it, the light of the thousand candles, then things can change. It comes to the radar, and as a community, as a society, we can begin to address some of the questions and some of the trouble that we see. So as parents, as educators, as community members, just start talking to your kids. Ask them what they're doing online. Ask them what types of apps they're using. Now, I don't expect anybody's kids. I got teenagers and I've got older kids. If I, when I have this conversation with them each time, I was basically told that I was nuts and I'm no way I'm going to tell you exactly what I'm doing online. And that's fine. But what they need to know is that I have an expressed interest in what they're doing online. And I hope that they understand that they can come and talk to me if they have questions. That's all we're asking. That's all that I'm asking today. So if we can take the thousand candles that we have here in this room and start having a real conversation about the things that need to be done and how to raise awareness, then maybe, just maybe, we can take our collective candle watts and shine some light on this really dark area of the web, this really dark underbelly of, of, of internet society, and hopefully in our lifetime, just simply eliminate it.